and we're back. You're sitting in Brian. Um, I hope you've had a nice, uh, a nice, a nice talk. And if you if you don't know about it, we'll be having sprints tomorrow and on Sunday. So feel free to sign up and sign up your projects. Sign up to do it. Everything. Um, do we have Matteo here? We do. Hello. Hey, hello. Can you? I think you. I think your sound is a bit low. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, it may be good. Maybe good. Okay, like that. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's good. Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, and you're going to <laughs> what are you going to teach us? You're going to teach us automation, right? Yeah. Oh, you can uh, use uh, Python to automate your daily life and your daily task. And uh, we will use uh, the git command as an example. We will uh, create a 90 line script. Uh, to remake the git commit command. I need this in my life, Matteo. Let's let's do it. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Uh, I will start by presenting myself. My name is Matteo Bertucci. I am a first year student in a French engineering preparatory class, Polytech Marseille. I've been enjoying Python for more than two years now and use it daily to automate various aspects of my life and have fun on larger projects. In my free times, I'm also part of the staff of, uh, of the largest online Python community, Python Discord. We aim to foster a welcoming atmosphere for newer and older Python enthusiasts. I would highly recommend you to join us at, at discord.com.gg uh, slash Python after the event if you want to continue the discussion or just chill out. This is my first time presenting a talk and I'm very glad to be here. This talk will go in two parts. In the first one, we will explore how the Git database, the core file storage of a Git repository, is structured. In the second part, we will write a 19-line script to replicate how the git commit command works. We'll go over some simple string manipulation and byte handling techniques and how to quickly make a Python utility script. During the last part, we will discuss into more detail how we got to the script and why. Every command uh, I will use in this part are, are made to be reproducible at home. I will highly recommend you to try those commands and even deviate from uh, the main path and try your own stuff and have fun. So what is the Git database? Well, in, hit, in each Git repository, you have a hidden .git folder that contains all the data Git needs to remember. It will contain remotes, hooks, logs, and what we are interested in today, objects. As you probably already know, Git gives each commit a 40-character uh, hexadecimal identifier. This identifier is actually the hash of the commit. But what is the hash, you may ask? Well, a hash is produced by an hash function. You pass a blob of data of any length to a, an hash function, and we will always return the same hash of the same length. Git uses the algorithm SHA-1, which stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. The thing is, commits are just a visible part of the iceberg, as we will see later on. What you need to remember for now is you can give any blob of data to the Git database, and it will give you back a unique 40 character identifier that you can use later to access the data again. Let's start with an example. We will start by initializing an empty repository using git init. Using the find command, we can see that the folder .git slash object, the git database itself, is empty. Then, using git hash object, we can store arbitrary data in the database. Here, using the command echo, we will provide the string example blob followed by a new line. Do note that we use the dash w uh, flag to actually save the object to the disk. Here, we got the hash uh, starting with bf. Using the same command as previously, we can see that a new object exists in the database with starting with the same hash bf. And finally, using the command git cat and the dash p flag to have a human readable output, we can check that we indeed stored this, this string example block. Something I would like to point out 
two is the structure of the database. As you may have noticed, the blob is actually stored in a subfolder called BF, which is which are the first two characters of the hash. So cool. Now that we know about the database itself, we can uh, look at what it actually contains. Let's create a test repository for that. So we'll start by running a few commands to have a reproducible environment. Since uh, commit includes metadata, such as the name of the author, uh, if it isn't the same as yours, we will have different hashes. We, we can start by creating a new repository, creating a SRC folder, and free or bogus files, a readme, a license, and a script. We'll add that, uh, that file to Git, and we can immediately see that three new objects have been added to the uh, database, starting with 00, B0, and C9. Using git hash object once again, we can double check that each uh, file maps indeed to uh, the content of a repository. Something that you may have noticed too, uh, the name of the file isn't included anywhere in those objects. The objects inside the git databases are all anonymous. Another object will have to give meaning to them. So let's now make an example commit. Let's call it example commit because it is very original. And look at the content of the database once again. As you can see, we have now three new objects, 27, 7, 6, and 8, 4. Let's investigate what those are. We'll start by the looking at the commit itself, as we could see on the terminal section 7, 6. As you can see, the structure is really quite simple. We have three fields, uh, the reference to the tree, the author, and the cometer identity. They are followed by a new line, and the commit body. As a side note, the author and the committer will always be the same unless you use some, something like uh, the author uh, flag on uh, the git commit command. Most observant viewer will probably notice uh, the tree ID is also part of the database. Let's see what it contains. It's also quite simple with only three lines. Uh, each line is uh, start with the file with the mode of the file which is uh, an integer saying what this file actually is, uh, followed by uh, the type of the file, so Azure, blob, or tree, and its hash and name. The last entry points to another tree, which just contains the script file. Uh, Git will uh, use nested uh, tree object to represent uh, larger uh, uh, directory structures. As a side note, uh, this representation isn't actually how the tree object is stored on the disk, as we will see in a few minutes. So let's now write some code. Uh, we can start by opening a file, and yeah, as it turns out, our objects are stored in plain text to save space. They are compressed or deflated, if you prefer, uh, using the right term, uh, using Zlib. We can use the built-in uh, Zlib library to inflate it. You can also notice you have a header at the beginning of the file. It contains uh, the file type, blob here, uh, the size, a null byte, and the actual content. The file hash can be very simply calculated by using the hashlib.char1 function on the, on the whole content of the file. Uh, I will also just like to stop here for a second and talk about byte handling in Python. When you create a string of, of uh, character, the computer must uh, store it somehow in memory. For that, we created a table mapping an actual uh, char English character to a chain of bytes in memory, like ASCII. Python uses Unicode plus UTF-8 uh, sorry, for a string, which uh, by default, allow more special characters to be used from foreign uh, languages. The problem with strings is they don't like random uh, bytes, such as uh, we saw previously with uh, the blob that was still uh, zipped. For that purpose, uh, through the type exists, uh, the bytes and the byte array, the former is immutable, just like string, while the latter is, you will usually use a battery when you need to modify part of the, uh, of the array at runtime. We won't need it uh, today. You have two main ways of creating a byte object. You can either prefix uh, a string with the letter B, 
which sadly means you can't combine it with the format string. Or the other method is to convert it back and forth with a string object using the encode and decode method. They both take an encoding parameter, which is usually UTF-8. With all that knowledge in mind, we can create our function. We will start with some import and by creating a pass constant, which is our database folder. If you don't know what passlib is, it is basically a fancier version of OS.pass uh, that uses classes. It is much easier to work with. This function will uh, take in the type of the blog as a string and uh, its actual content as a byte and we turn the hash as an hexadecimal string. Next, we can construct the blob of data we are actually going to store that follows the git model. We will start by putting the, the type, a space, the file size, a null byte represented by a backslash and a zero, which is just a shorthand for a backslash q and for zero, and the actual content of the blob. We use the legacy C style formatting here because we cannot use a B string the format string, as I said previously. Uh, what happened here is each percent has for string and percent D for digit is replaced by the element in the tuple like so. We can now use the hash lib function uh, to compute the hash and the lib to compress the blob. We can use we will use hash underscore to avoid colliding with the hash built-in function like we did with the type argument. Uh, as you may have remembered, the object are stored in a subdirectory, uh, which is the first two letters of the hash. We can represent that by using object pass forward slash hash underscore. We make sure this folder exists and write the compressed data down and return the hash. Now, we can write a quick small function to take any parameter, any pass, sorry, as a parameter and store the content of the file database using the type blob. This is quite simple. We just open the, the file in read binary mode as we want to handle stuff like images, which are in text and call write objects. Easy, right? Now it's time for the less easy part, writing a tree or a folder if you prefer. Each line in the tree object will be the mode of the file, a space, its name, a null byte, and the hash stored in raw binary. We'll also uh, create a constant that will be all of our inert folders. We don't want to be actually committing the git database to the git database, uh, or PyCache folder, or even our own uh, commit implementation. Then we can list every subfile or subfolder in the target folder and sort the array as it is required by git for some reason. I will do a quick stop here and talk about recursion. Let's take this example. Our goal is to make an example function that takes two arguments. The first one being the level of nesting of the list return, and the second one being the length of each, of each list. We'll start by a simpler version. Here we just want to generate a list of duckies of a certain length. It is quite simple. We just make a for loop and add the string uh, many times to the list and return it. Let us do a stuck conversion. We now two next nested list. The second argument will be a boolean saying if the list should be nested or not. The second argument is set to false. We can just have the same logic as before. But if it is true, we could use a two nested loop to represent uh, this nested structure, right? But that will be just repeating the same code once again. So what if we instead make the function call itself to return a non listed list with the second argument set to false and add it to a larger list? This way we will have the nested structure we want. Now we can move on to our final step, generating an arbitrary amount of nested list. Well, we use almost the exact same logic. Instead of using a Boolean, we use an, int an integer saying how many levels we still are left and decrease it by one each time we want to call the function. If we are on the last level, one, we can just return our final list. If that isn't clear, here is a visualization of what happens when you call the function with the argument free free. The function will first call itself free time with the argument two and three. Each of those calls will then call itself again with the argument one free. 
and those last call will yield a list of three duckies, creating this nested structure of 27 duckies. Now the question you may be asking is, why the heck did that talk about this crazy technique? Well, if you look at it this way, uh, all this is quite similar to folders, don't you think? Uh, we can have an arbitrary amount of nested uh, folders and want to handle that properly. So let's get back to our code. Here we are. With, uh, on a, we have a list of uh, every children files of the starting folder. We can iterate over each file. If it is part of the included path, we just move on to the next iteration using the continue keyword. If it is a directory, we call the write function once again, making a recursive call. This means if there is another directory inside another one, inside another one, we will still be able to handle them. If it is a file, we simply call write blob. As you may have noticed, I store it every time at the hash of the new object and a mode value. Once they are saved to the database, we can create the robot object from 40 character hash. We need a 27 byte array, and generate the last, the line as we saw previously, and add it to the lines. Once all of your files are processed, we can stick all the lines together, write the object, and return the hash. So the OLAS function that will interact with the Git database, it is the one to store Git commit. It is really quite simple. We write down the tree of the current folder. We create a commit according to the template we saw earlier, and a few constants we just defined, and encode it into a byte object, write it, and return the hash. The reason I'm using a uh, string here is just to make my life easier when we're templating. It's totally safe to do so, since all the characters inside the commit object will always be valid UTF-8 character, or at least we can assume that they will be. This assertion isn't true for object object for other objects, and we uh, could have run into a uh, decoding error. We are close to the end of the script, so all that's left to do is to create our script interface. We want to be able to call our script on the command line by adding a commit message as an argument. Each of those arguments, including uh, my, uh, my underscore commit.py, will be based as a list in uh, sys.argv. One not worthy thing is how the shell handle parameter. We normally split them at space and support a quote around, like in this simple example. We don't want to put quotes around because we simply don't have any reason to do so. We don't have any special flag. We don't have many parameters. For that, it's super easy. We just have to join them with space. A good jump to follow when creating a script is having your main script in the if name equals main branch with all of the underscore. I call that the main world. You may have already seen it. Uh, to understand what he uh, really does, we need to understand what the name vendor represents. We can install two little scripts with start being ran and imported being imported. As you can see, inside imported, the value of main will be imported itself. But in start, it will be the vendor string main. What uh, this vendor actually is, is uh, it is always the name of the file that is being run, except for entry point, in which it will be uh, the dunder string main. The goal of this weird-looking branch is, uh, imagine that I want, for any, for any reason, uh, make a new script that will rely on those uh, little function we just created. We will run to uh, import our script, and this branch here will be evaluated to false and prevent our script from actually triggering a new commit, because that's simply not what we want we want. We just want to access the utility function. So let's get back to our code. We will add an import sys at the end of our file, or beginning, sorry, and add a main guard. We'll start by checking that we actually have a second argument. A good rule of thumb to follow when making a command like tune is error should be handled gracefully. Imagine you want to use this tool you built uh, two months ago, and you have a cryptic index error. Unless you dive into the source code, we'll be able to understand what actually happened. That's why error handling is so important. If there is an error, we follow the unique standard by writing the script name followed by two dots and the error message. After that, we exit with a non-zero code signaling to the initiator of the script that it failed. We can simply create uh, the argument, the message from the argument, make a commit and write a message. We are finally done with our script. This 
Start for our final test. Here is our original commit starting with the hash 76. We will delete our .git folder, reinitialize the database, and run our script. As you can see, we have the same commit hash, meaning that the database is the same. Our job has been successful. In reality, creating this, uh, this script uh, took me less than an hour from uh, researches to the actual finished product. I would just like to take a minute to discuss how we structure the script and why choosing Python to do so. The screenshot, you can see your entire code zoomed out. Each little part of our script is, is divided into more or less tiny functions. This way, if I ever write another script that need to access the Git internals, I can just snag some function and save time. This is the main reason we added the main grant to be able to reuse our utility function. Similarly, it will be easier to navigate if you ever go back to your code and have to change it. Modularity is more often the key than it isn't. Good documentation is also important, both through talk string and actual comments. I will also recommend you to follow a code style such as pep8 to have a common style across all of your files. Type hitting is also a good way of communicating what the function expects and spills out. All of these tools combined allow you to, uh, un to still understand your code weeks after you wrote it, which in my opinion is quite important for small script or even larger projects. Uh, last thing I would like to stop on is why choosing out of all the possible language Python. Well, simply because we aren't at Euro Python or worse, it is as simple as that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, for real, uh, Python is an excellent choice for quick string team, in my opinion, because it is, fast, it is fast to write. You don't have to stop and wonder what kind of computer science madness you are going to use to make the compiler accept your types of anything. The, uh, typing is quite powerful here. Additionally, having an, uh, an interactive shell is quite powerful to explore your data, like we did at the beginning with the git blob. Plus, it is a language we are all more or less familiar here. All of this makes Python a very powerful language, in my very own uh, opinionated opinion. That's it for me. Thank you for listening for me today at Python 2021. You can flash this QR code to have access to the final code, or we'll pass the, the link into my tricks in a few minutes. Thank you so much, Matteo, for the for the talk. Um, I I have one question. Um, <laughs> why did you build this in the first place? What, what were you trying to automate? Well, uh, this is more of an example script. It doesn't have any anything useful, you may say. Um, it is just a way to have fun with a Git database because. Uh, I feel like uh, looking at the internals of, uh, of an existing uh, tool is very, it's always very interesting. I often do that with Git, uh, Docker, and stuff like that. And uh, it is also quite short to do. Uh, we could uh, have it in uh, 90 lines, and uh, it is quite good for a talk, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the best way to learn about something is to write a, write a, a client for it, right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, thanks again for coming. Um, we'll be we'll be going to 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 the break now since there's no no more questions. Uh, thanks again, Matteo. That's a pleasure. <laughs>